Greetings, mysterious Cadian pylons, and welcome to Codex Compliant. Since it's the 30th proper episode of the series, let's do something we've been meaning to do for a while and look at 2003's Codex Eye of Terror. Abaddon the Despoiler's 13th Black Crusade eclipses all that has gone before. Under the eye of his diabolic patrons, he has finally united many of the warring factions of Chaos under one banner. Codex Eye of Terror is similar to the Armageddon Codex that we covered two years ago. Good lord, was it really two years ago? Anyway, it's like Codex Armageddon in that it was from 3rd edition, allowed you to fight battles within a specific in-universe campaign, Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade to be specific, and was accompanied by a real-world campaign where players could affect the canonical outcome of the in-universe one. It was written by Andy Chambers, Pete Haynes, Andy Hoare, Phil Kelly and Graham McNeil. It is also, generally speaking, considered to be pretty good, so let's take a look. The book was split into three sections, the background lore for the conflict, a colour section full of pretty models, and finally, four new army lists you could use. The background section opened with an ominous passage from Eldrad Ulthran describing the oncoming war. I see the stars stained red with the blood of the Monkai, and though their walls do not concern me, and I would gladly let them destroy one another, I know that to avoid this fight is to condemn my race to inevitable doom. Then we got an overview of the Horus Heresy and the planet of Cadia, including an excerpt from the Dan Abnett novel Malleus, describing the mysterious pylons of Cadia. Just mentioning that because they don't tend to directly quote from the novels very often. They then moved on to describe the events of the Gothic War. You know, this old thing. The game that Games Workshop would absolutely bring back if they weren't complete and utter cowards! I'm, I'm, I'm actually joking. I, I just think it would be really cool to like see little baby spaceships again. Okay, um, thank you. I love you. Mwah. Basically, they needed to talk about this so you're aware of the two Blackstone fortresses Abaddon nicked during the war, and that he has a rather large ship called the Planet Killer, which also has a weapon known as the Armageddon Gun. And since this is 40k, neither of those names are hyperbolic. It then led on to the prelude to the 13th Black Crusade. Plague and panic spreading around the sectors close to the eye. A space fleet is spotted and engaged led by the Terminus Est, the flagship of the Herald of Nurgle, Typhus. Amidst this unrest, apocalyptic cults begin to form, spreading even more violence and paranoia, and eventually those killed by the plague rose again and began attacking the living. At this time, the Emperor's Tarot produced only dire portents, and the Cadian pylons began resonating with an almost imperceptible vibration, and upon close inspection were showing microscopic stress fractures trying to hold back the intensifying warp storm. Which, coincidentally, also happens to perfectly describe the state of my mental health this past year. Then the attacks began, small at first. The Imperial forces mustered knowing that a large battle was imminent, but guardsmen meant to reinforce Cadia showed themselves to be renegades, killing many of Cadia's command staff, leading Ursacar Creed to take over the defence. The Imperial forces continued to build until a huge Chaos fleet, numbering hundreds of warships, emerged from the Eye of Terror led by the Planet Killer and accompanied by Abaddon's two stolen Blackstone fortresses. After breaking through the Imperial lines, they set up a forward base on the edge of the Cadian system. The invasion of Cadia had begun. So yeah, it did a pretty good job of setting up this huge conflict, with parts here and there to show how many factions this conflict would involve, like this nod to the Necrons. Hell, even Cypher shows up because of course he bloody does. We'd also like to talk about the cover of the Codex for a second. It's by Karl Kapinski, and it really stands out as a Codex cover, not just because the vibrant pink of the Eye of Terror and the orange of the flames frame Abbey in a pleasing way, or though it does, but because every other bit of Codex cover art is supposed to be like... a literal thing. As in, it's a representation of something that is supposed to be literally happening in-universe. Just... dudes shooting dudes. Even if where they're shooting, or how they're positioned, wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if they weren't posing for a book cover. But the Eye of Terror cover was not that. Obviously, there is a lot of 40k lore, and I'm no expert on every single part of it, but I'm fairly sure that at no point canonically is Abaddon hundreds of thousands of miles tall and literally holding the planet of Cadia in his hand. It's supposed to be metaphorical, he's holding the fate of the Imperium in his hand, and Codex covers don't usually do that kind of thing, and that makes it kinda neat. But with all that pesky lore and stuff aside, you ravenous little nerglings want to know what you can do in-game with this book, don't you? Well, 
Codex Eye of Terror contained army lists for four armies. The Cadian Shock Troops, the Lost and the Damned, the Althway Strike Force, and the Space Wolves 13th Company, all of which required existing codices to play. Of course, pretty much every faction in 40k was involved in the campaign somewhere or another, these are just the four new forces created for use in it, and beyond. Akkadian Shock Troopers' army was fairly similar to a standard Imperial Guard army of the time. Not surprising, considering Cadians are kind of the ultramarines of the Imperial Guard, although they couldn't use any of the ab human units, Rough Riders, Griffins, or a couple of Lehman Russ variants. To make up for those restrictions, they got access to sanctioned psychers, Cassican squads, which are really just their version of stormtroopers, but they could take them as a troop's choice, Cadian Pattern Sentinels, a regular sentinel but with an autocannon, and Youth Army Platoons, which were just worse guardsmen, who can fight in huge squads of up to 50 on account of them literally being teenagers. Cadia starts them young, and en masse. There were also rules for Ursacar Creed and his standard bearer Jaren Kell, who could lead a Cadian army of 1,500 points or higher. But like most of what's in the Shock Troopers army list, they'd end up available in some form in the next Guard Codex, which came out not too long after the Eye of Terror Codex was released. And also, props to Games Workshop for giving us a pronunciation guide for one of their made-up words for once. Good job. The Ulthway Strike Force was an Eldar army that lacked the heavier things like Falcon Grav Tanks or Wave Serpents, and, regardless of mission, started games with at least half of their force in reserve. These would then enter play through Wraith Gates that could be placed down as a safe way to enter play. After all, Deep Striking was a lot more hazardous in 3rd edition than it is now. Okay, I'm just going to roll to see how far that Terminator squad scatters. They're all lost in the warp. Cool. The army mostly consisted of Black Guardian variants of existing Eldar units, which more or less just meant they had a better ballistic skill on account of their greater experience, but are also prone to tactically running away more often. The HQ choices for the Strike Force were also a little different, only having two options. The Spear of Cain was just an avatar but with an escort of Warlocks, and the Seer Council was a squad made of two Farseers and three Warlocks. I think the Eldar were just a little jealous of the command squads that the Guard got. The Space Wolves 13th Company were the great company who disappeared in the Eye of Terror and have spent the last 10,000 years fighting the forces of chaos. Or however long it felt like to them, in the Eye, the flow of time is convoluted after all. These wolves followed Abaddon's Black Crusade out of the Eye and continued to attack them as they descended upon the Imperium. The 13th Company still sported the pre-heresy Space Wolf colour scheme, but were seen wearing salvaged pieces of chaos armour. Beggars can't be choosers in the Eye of Terror, I suppose? In-game, there were a very restricted, mostly infantry-based Space Wolves variant. Only having access to Wolf Lords, Rune Priests, Wolf Priests, Wolfen, Stormclaws, which was their version of Wolfguard, Grey Slayers, which was their Grey Hunter equivalent, Fenrisian Wolves, Stormclaw Bikers, and their very own version of Longfangs. For the most part, these units were just a little bit better than their regular Space Wolf equivalents to represent the millennia they've spent fighting the forces of chaos. The two unique units were the Fenrisian Wolves, played here by Warhammer Fantasy Wolves because they didn't have their own unique models yet, which were present in the main codex but only as bodyguards, not as a dedicated squad. And then there's the Wolfen, which wouldn't be available to mainline Space Wolves for quite some time. All of the 13th Company are afflicted with the Curse of the Wolfen, and Wolfen Packs were just those in whom it had fully manifested. You could even give a Wolf Lord the Mark of the Wolfen upgrade, which would mean that you could take Wolfen as a troop's choice, if you really wanted to go heavy on the whole werewolf thing. Many of the rules for this army were based around mobility. From the Wolfen's extra d6 of movement, to the Rune Priest's gate power that allowed you to teleport squads, to the entire army, barring bikes and terminators, getting a free move at the start of the game. These rules allowed this infantry-heavy army to get across the board more quickly so they could get up close and introduce your enemies to a Wolfen's Weapon Skill 5, Strength 5 attacks. Also, and I know I don't really have to tell anyone this, but uh, brace yourselves, I'm going to anyway. The 13th Company are rad as hell, and they're the reason I went with a pre-heresy colour scheme on Marewolves. And finally we get to the Lost and the Damned. This was a Chaos list that would be led by a Chaos Marine or two, maybe some possessed in there, but the rest would be Renegade Guard and things mutated by the powers of Chaos with a smattering of demons. Which is cool because you encounter forces like this in Black Library novels all the time, but you haven't always been able to play them on the tabletop. This means you had access to neat things like Chaos Rough Riders or even Chaos Rhinos driven by Chaos Guardsmen. And honestly, I didn't think Guardsmen had ever been able to drive Rhinos outside of Rogue Trader, so that was a fun detail to come across. 
However, the mutants are the real big draw here. Mutants could be built in many different ways, from simple mindless plague zombies to squads with guns, special weapons, icon bearers, and boss characters who could take equipment from the Chaos Codex. Squads could also have a blessing from one of the four Chaos Gods to give them a little bit of local colour. Big mutants were, and I don't want to get too technical here, like the regular mutants, but big. Although, admittedly, there was a lot less customization available to them. They also got chaotic dogs. And dogs are good. As you can imagine, all these mutated units were a prime excuse for people to go wild with conversions, and the colour section has a whole segment about ways to make them, mixing fantasy and 40k models in fun and interesting ways. A couple of highlights being this guy with an orc head for a body, or this lad who scoots his funky self along on this tiny little wheel. Anyway, it's all very Realm of Chaos mutation tables, and we're 100% here for it. The rest of the colour section is pretty nice too, but we've been showing parts of it throughout the video, so there's not much else to say about it. Although it is interesting to see tons of the old Metal Cadian models on display here, both as loyalists and traitors. This was probably their last major appearance too, since they were replaced with a plastic kit very shortly after this book was published. And that's pretty much everything in the book. But what about the real-world Eye of Terror campaign? How'd that go? Well, that, my friends, is a whole thing. You see, we weren't playing the game during 2003, and the website set up to present the information is, um... Well, it's not handling its imprisonment in the Wayback Machine particularly well. But, from what we can gather, the campaign featured lots of sectors for players of different factions to fight for control over. Players would submit their games to be part of the campaign, slowly taking over places and weakening their opponent's grip on those sectors around it. Games weren't just relegated to 40k, you could also submit games of Battlefleet Gothic, Inquisitor, or Epic 40,000 if you so desired, with GW periodically putting out a newsletter recounting the events and canonizing what happened. During the campaign, coalitions of players began to form, working together and planning out strategies so they could target the most effective, um, targets. Something that the Chaos side was overall far better at, according to all of the accounts that we've read, which led to them being one step ahead the majority of the time. However, it seems like the campaign had a fair bit of drama, with accusations of cheating, such as players submitting victories for battles they hadn't actually fought, or people from the opposing sides infiltrating those online coalitions to spy on what they're doing. Games Workshop did do stuff to combat the former problem, but it's basically impossible to tell how widespread such an issue was or wasn't in reality. There's also a fair amount of people who think that GW had its thumb on the scales the whole time, adding to the feeling that things were a little less fair than they should have been. We're not saying any of that is a fair representation of what happened. We don't know, we weren't there, and it was nearly 20 years ago. But a lot of people believe these things to be true, so regardless, they do become part of the narrative when people discuss it nowadays. So, you know, we thought it best to mention. The final result was declared as a narrow chaos victory, which many felt should have been more decisive, and that result didn't really end up affecting the universe all that much, from the perspective of people playing the game anyway. In universe, Andy Chambers blew up a planet, so, you know, that probably mattered to the people on it. So you had this huge battle with war councils, espionage, and people believing the other side was breaking the rules that all ended with a vaguely unsatisfying result with the side that technically won, feeling like they'd kinda lost. In short, it feels like it was a pretty accurate representation of most real-world wars. The dissatisfaction was probably amplified by the fact that 40k's timeline was pretty static and unmoving for, well, most of its existence. It would take until 2017 and the Gathering Storm series for them to have a bit of a do-over of the events of the campaign and finally finish what Codex Eye of Terror started. So that narrow chaos victory became Abaddon dropping a Blackstone Fortress on Cadia, pretty decisively shattering the gate, which then led to the Great Rift and the advancement of the 40k timeline we got with the coming of 8th edition. But despite the Eye of Terror campaign having a bit of a mixed legacy, the Eye of Terror Codex is still well regarded to this day. And that's not surprising, from the iconic cover art to establishing a ton of lore, to the fun and interesting army lists. Honestly, if we were playing at the time that this came out, we'd have totally made mutation heavy loss on the damned armies, even if it would have meant spending most of the game rifling through three separate codices. 
And of course, several units from this book, like the Warfen or Cadian Sentinels, eventually became things their respective armies could just take in their regular codexes. Plus, I'm sure it was nice for people who made Chaos armies full of mutants and rogue trader or cultist armies in 2nd edition to finally have an army list that they could use again. In short, it's pretty good, isn't it? That's the end of the video. Bye!